Genesis thirteen fifteen. Abraham has been doing some pretty uh, wild things down in Egypt. He's leaving. He went down there and sold his wife to Pharaoh, came back out of there, and came out a very rich man. Now Lot, Lot's uh, family and his slaves, Lot had slaves. Lot had several girls, we find out. It talks about two, but there were more than that. We read the book of Jasher, I think it was last week, and we found out a lot about Lot's life and what happened down in the sins of Sodom. We have Lot and Abraham's family arguing over the land, and Abraham says, you go one way and I go another way, and then we find out that Lot went down to where? To Sodom and the other four cities. Uh, he went down to that area and uh, changed his occupation. He had been a shepherd before, and a cattleman, and now he becomes what? A judge and a lawyer down at law, down in, in the Sodom, Gomorrah, and those uh, cities there. There were five cities all together. Then we're going to have the battle of the kings, and God saves Sodom and all the kings and the cities thereof for what? They were horrible people. So we're going to see about that. We we read about them last week in the book of Joshua, which is a history book. Did you get? No, no you you got to listen to that class. The description in the book of Joshua of Sodom and Gomorrah and those cities is unbelievable. What they did. They they tortured people. They robbed people. This is what they did. They were just scoundrels in the lowest level. Thirteen fifteen key. Et, Kal, Haaretz, Asher, Ota, Roe, Lika, Etani, Noah, Yulezaraka, Ad, Olam. Now God is promising Abraham, and He's making a unconditional covenant with him. Unconditional covenant, brother Rush. You remember what an unconditional covenant is? All right, it's a covenant made by God, and it depends on nothing that any human element at all, does it? Yeah. Now, we have two Abrahamic covenants that have not been fulfilled yet, and this is one of them, right here. When is this going to be filled, Brother Roger? Uh, when he brings him back to Israel. When is this covenant going to be fulfilled? Okay, now we're going to find out that God is recathering Israel. Mm -hmm. That actually has happened. Israel is still at odds with God, aren't they? Right, have they accepted the Messiah yet? No. no. Do they have the land? Are they claiming God like a national asset still? This is our land. God gave it to us. But they only get the land when, Brother Roger? After the tribulation period. When they repent when they repent. And then God will bring in the millennial reign, which Hank Canegraaff doesn't believe in, that most of your covenant theologians don't believe in at all. So at all. But we do have... Now, what do some people believe today? What is the idea of the all millennials? Do you remember, Sharon? That we're already there. We're already in the millennium, that the millennium is what? In the, in your heart. In the hearts of the believers. We're in the spiritual millennium, and, it, and we're in that millennium right now, and that's all the millennium there will ever be. It's not to make the, God's millennium on the earth a physical aspect, they say, is to downgrade and degrade the promises of God. To make them flesh and blood instead of spiritual. The kingdom of God is not flesh and blood, they say. But is the millennial kingdom to all the promises? I mean, I just finished 67 classes on the kingdom of God. And I read hundreds of promises in the Bible that promised a literal kingdom of God on earth. And they say it's not literal. And then what does the post-millennial people believe? Post-millennial. You know that one, Brother Green? 
No, it's the Brown, I mean. Stephen Brown? Um, Post millennialism. That the millennium is coming, the Lord is coming after. Right. Okay. What they believe is like the Catholic Church taught, and Augustine taught, and John Calvin taught, and Luther taught, taught that the church will permeate the world and will convert the world, and then Christ will come back after we brought in the millennium. And they quote two parables to prove that point. What are those two parables? Sharon? One's a mustard tree. Mustard tree, which all the birds come and settle into them. That is the worldwide religion that's going to, everybody's going to be saved. And what's the other one? The leaven. The meal and the leaven. The meal and the leaven. Where the leaven, uh, the whole loaf is leavened. Okay? And they say that's the gospel. But that's not what, leaven is never a type of good in the Bible, is it? And actually, women, the woman that hid this in there is like the devil, the same person as the devil that sowed the tares in the field of the king. Same one. The millennium is going to be brought in by the Lord himself. We're not going to do it. How, how does the, as far as... Uh, Augustinism and Calvinism and Luther and all of their ideas of bringing in the kingdom. Uh, how is that going? What's the, what's the chances of that happening? Uh, this post-millennial idea, what's the chances of that happening? Zero. All I can see is that the world's going to become a Muslim world before too long, before too many years. That's what it looks like to me, and that's not Christianity. How many of you have heard of what heard of Chrislam? Chrislam. You know what Chrislam is? What's Chrislam? The merger of the, the Muslims with the evangelical church. Yeah, the the merger of the Muslims with the evangelical church. What? How many concessions does Islam make? Zip. Zero. How many concessions do the Christians have to make? Much All much of more. it. Don't say anything about Jesus being God the Son. But anything about him being God or anything about being saved, that's not it. I mean, you can say all the good things about Jesus being a prophet and the, the virgin of a virgin Mary and all this, but don't say that he's God and don't say that he was crucified on the cross. Now, if you take out the crucifixion and Jesus being God, what do you have? Islam. That's right. You have Islam. That's what you have. You have no Savior. Well, the Lord's going to come back one of these days. And He's going to bring in that millennial kingdom. And Israel's promises are unconditional, but not until they repent. They will repent right here at this period of time when they see that they're going to be killed, all of them, by the Antichrist. And according to Islam, who was their antichrist? Or who was their counter, what we call juxtaposition person with the antichrist of the book of Revelation? The Mahdi. The Mahdi. Okay, who is their beast? The beast. The beast. All right. What does their beast do? Mark all the true believers in Islam. Okay, mark all the true believers in Islam and damn the others. Okay. And who is uh, the Jesus of Islam? What difference? The, the Jesus of the Bible does what? What's he do? What's he do with Israel? He saves Israel right here. He saves Israel by his powers, by what we call earthly powers. He uses the earth to save them. And then at the end, he saves them and brings in the millennial reign and destroys all of their enemies. Now, Jesus of Islam, which is Issa, what does he do? Kills all the Jews. Kills all the Christians. And destroys all of other religions. He breaks the cross and destroys all other religions. And then he kills all the pigs. That's what he does. And he aligns himself with the Mahdi, which I believe is a counterpart to the, to the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. The beast is there. 
And now we have the false Jesus, the false prophet, so-called. So we have all that unholy trinity. We have the unholy trinity in the book of Revelation, and we have the unholy trinity in Islamic end times or eschatology. We have that both. They all agree. One thing. They're going to kill all the... The Antichrist is going to kill the Jews. And, and Islam today, what is their purpose with the Jews? Kill them. Wipe them off the face of the earth. Period. Wipe them off. And why did they want to do this, Brother Roger? Why did, did Muhammad want to kill all the Jews? Because they wouldn't say that he was the prophet. They wouldn't say that he was the prophet that was, that was promised. They wouldn't do this. So he's going to kill them. You have the book, and you've been lying. You show me. It says in that book where I'm supposed to come. And, of course, Muhammad also said that he was all. Who? The Paraclete. Who's the Paraclete? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. He said he was a Paraclete. That's the promised one that would come on the day of Pentecost. He was, a, of course, he's just about, what, 700 years too late? <laughs> yeah, well, that don't mean nothing to him because he didn't know Adam's time from Noah's time or Jacob's time from Adam's time or whatever. He's got them all living together in, in, in parts in the, in the Quran. 1315, because et, what's et? Sign of the direct object. How do you translate that? You don't. You just have the idea in your head, don't you? That's action going next. And then we have call. Call is all. Call is all. All. Ha'aris, all the land. Look at that ha on the front of that. What is that, Brother uh, Steve? Ha. What do you call that thing? A ha'aretz. One, two, three, four. From the right, the four, the fourth word. All right. Huh? Okay. What's what's ha? Ha is a definite article. Definite article. Tohristikon, our throne in Greek. The definite article. Okay. And it's on page 206 in Brown, Driver, and Briggs. This put down our DA down there, definite article. The land. What kind of land is this, Sharon? Um, dry land. Dry land. This is occupied land, isn't it? This is land that can be occupied by people. This, this can, land that can be people. So all the land which, Ota. Which you, and how does this ota here, how do you make up that word, Brother Roger? Okay, it's third person plural. No, second person Second plural. person? Second person plural. Okay, all right. And it's ah and then ta. Okay, it's second person singular, actually. Oh. Yeah, second person singular. It's oh, you, okay. Yeah. okay. And how to actually, where does that actually come from? It comes from the sign of the direct object with a suffix, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah. Ota. But we change the et there to an o sound. See that little dash below it? That means it's o. Okay, that's o. That's a vowel sign. O ta. And uh, that dot in the middle, that doggish in the middle of that towel there, what's that do, Brother Roger? It emphasizes it. It emphasizes the strong T. It makes it T sound instead of a, a TH sound. And then roe. Roe. Here we have for the word for shepherd word shepherd because all the land which you seeing look at this now conjugate that word for me uh, share, um, Pamela uh, participle masculine singular cal participle so it's masculine singular and that's who that's Abraham okay he's seeing and what and what kind of action is that Sharon this participle one of them continuing things, like a gerund in English. All right. Cal participle, seeing, continued to see, to all, or to you, that is, lika, to you. And there we have another preposition with a suffix on it, don't we? We had a direct, we had to sign a direct object with a suffix on it, and now we got a preposition with a suffix. To you, lika, to you. And then we have itanina. Itanina. And that is 
I shall give her to you. I shall give her. Who is the her? The, the land. The land. Land is what? Feminine. Feminine. All right. How about the word for land in, in Greek? What's that word? Who knows what that word is? Where did hagios come from? It? Hagios. All right. What's hagios mean, Sharon? Well, that's not of this Not of earth. So what is the word for earth? There it is right there, gay. And what kind of gender is that? Feminine. feminine. Again, feminine, feminine, feminine. Feminine in Hebrew and feminine in Greek. I'm saying to you, I shall give her. And that is first person contrast for senior, cal and perfect. I shall keep on giving her. I haven't changed my mind. God hasn't changed his mind. This is his unconditional covenant. And then it says, Yuli Zaraka. Yuli Zaraka. What is the Greek equivalent of that, Brother Roger? Sperma. Sperma. All right, sperma. That's seed. To seed of you is what it literally says. Seed of you. Okay, what case is that in, Brother Roger? Seed of you. And to, huh? Genitive? That's right. Genitive is a case of what? Possession. Okay, a case of possession. Genitive is a case of possession. How many, how many uh, cases are there, uh, Brother Brown? Seven. How many? Seven. No. How many cases are there? Eight. Can you name Who can name those eight cases? Nominative, genitive, ablative, locative, instrumental, dative, accusative, and vocative. There's eight of them, okay? How many cases are there, is there in Sanskrit, Brother Roger? I'm going to say eight. That's right. You're right. See, you got it. All right. That's an old language. It's very much akin to this, these Oriental languages. You lay Zaraka. You there on the front of it. You there. What is that? That's a while and it's conjunction, page 253. It starts out with you here. It can mean wa in many places, but here it's you because it has that little dot in the middle of it, doesn't it? And then we have a lament there. And what is a lament, uh, uh, Pamela? What's a lament? That's preposition, page 515, if you want to write that down. That preposition and to, and then the, the, the raka. The raka there. The raka, it comes from zera, sperma in Greek, zera in Hebrew. And then on that, the cough on the end of that, Brother Roger, is a case of possession in it. That's belonging to you. And to your seed. And then we have odd there. This is a, uh, like a uh, adverb of time or a preposition of time. <coughs> And what's that mean there, Brother Roger? Odd. It's either for or because. Odd. This means, this is time. This is time. This is a preposition or an adverb of time. Until or unto or as far as. Okay? It has an idea of time and, uh, and longevity. As far as olam. Hold on. And in Greek it would say Aestoniona. 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 Unto the ages of the ages. Ages of the ages. And Brother Roger, what does Olam mean? Give me the idea of Olam. It's eternity past and eternity future. Yeah. And the future is you go as far as you can think and then it starts there. Okay, you go as far as you can think in eternity, and that's where Olam starts. <laughs> that's something, isn't it? Yeah. Go as far as you can imagine, and that's where Olam starts. That's where Ace Tony On Tony On starts, too. 1316. We Somti. Et Zaraka. Kafar. Haaretz. Asher, Im, 
you call Ish Limnoth. That town end should be a th, okay? And then et, afar, haaretz, gam, zaraka, yeman ne. And I shall place. And I shall place. Look at that. What's that word come from there, Brother Roger? See that root down there? Yeah, so it's probably Shin, which is place, monument, or name. Okay, place, monument, or name. And who would, who, what son of Noah would bring forth the Messiah? Shem. Shem. What son of Noah would make his name known among all the nations? Shem, which were, we go from Shem, we go down to Noah, we go down to Abraham. Look at on the chart up there. This is where it comes from. All the way from Shem, way back yonder, after the flood, we go from Shem, we go to Abraham, and Abraham, he had a son named what? Yitchik. Yitchik. What's Yitchik mean? Pleasure. pleasure. Laughter, joy, pleasure. Yitchik. That changes the whole idea. You know, we are always here to, to laugh, but you look at that word, it means pleasure, it means joy, it kissing, holding, loving. That's all in that word, in that word yitchik. And then we have Isaac, and then who did he have? Who? What children did he have? He had one rebel and one pretty good guy. He had Esau and Jacob. And of course Jacob was the was the promised son. He was going to be the patriarch. And who was on the throne of Israel when Jesus was born? Herod's descendant, which was Esau's descendant. What a slap in the face of Israel. And they liked it, didn't they? They liked it. He built them a beautiful temple. The most beautiful thing in the world. Look at her. This is our place, you know. I shall make a place. First person construct, senior Cal Wow consecutive, perfect. I shall have made a place. Or make a place for your seed. Et, sign of direct optic, seed. Zareka. Zareka means seed of you, doesn't it? Seed of you. Seeding seed belonging to you. And what case is that in, Sharon? Genitive case. So uh, you write down genitive down down right below that. All right. Now in Greek, this would be really weird. The Greek and the Hebrew here just don't uh, correspond, do they? Why, brother Roger? In Greek, this would we you, we'd have another word behind that. You'd have to explain this in Greek. In Hebrew. All of it's inflected into one word, but there's a sign of the direct object in front of it, isn't it? Yeah. That's that's weird. See, now this sign of the direct object, it is turned into a kind of a, a personal pronoun, which is repeated again on the cough at the end of that word, zera, zeraka. But it would be an accusative case in Greek with that with that sign of the direct object. And then it would have a genitive pronoun behind it. In Greek you, or in Hebrew, you got it all in one word. And then whether have the word ka'afar, ka'afar. So did they have that problem when they were doing the Septuagint? They, when they translated the Septuagint, Brother Roger, what did they do? Was it, is it correct? They made it up. I mean, <laughs> I mean what, what were they doing? I mean, the myth of hiding in a room and 70 scholars put it together. They were translating the Septuagint as the Mishnah and the Talmud. This is what's going on there. This is what they believe. They translated the Septuagint from the Hebrew Bible in the terms of what they, not by translation, not by, not by literal translation, but by what? Interpretation. It's not a translation, it's interpretation. <coughs> we find out. In Genesis 1 and 1, it says that in one of the beginnings, God had created the heavens and the earth. And in the Septuagint, 
It doesn't say that. Period. The the numbers are all off. It is singular. It is not plural. And not only that, but it says in Genesis 1 and 2 in the Septuagint that the earth kept on being formless and void. Not became formless and void. But that was their idea. See, they believed in the Babylonian idea of creation. Yeah. Yes. It wasn't an oral translation. It's a literal translation. Let me give you the idea of the Septuagint. Okay, this is what the tradition of the Septuagint is. They took 72 scholars and they put them in 72 cells, cells, rooms. And <coughs> when they were finished, and how many days? Like 30, or so. 30 days or something, they translated the whole Old Testament and they came out word for word, every one of them with the same translation. Now, that's not true, but that's what they say about it. That's, but this is not true. Now, this is, this is what we call a fairy tale. I can, any of you students, we could read the Hebrew Bible and we could read the Septuagint, which I don't have with me right now, but I can almost tell you exactly what it says. But you could tell me where it's incorrect, can't you? All right? You know enough Greek and enough Hebrew to say, to say that this is, couldn't be that way. This is not what it says in Hebrew. So that Septuagint is a interpretation of the Hebrew Bible. How about the Jerusalem Publication Society? Do you have that with you, uh, Sharon? I mean, not Sharon, but Pamela? Mm -hmm. Do you have that? Can I borrow that for just a moment? <coughs> Got to hide in there someplace? All right. Jewish Publication Society, that's a JPS Bible. It's called the Tanakh. It says Tanakh in, in Hebrew, and it says Tanakh here. Now, it starts from the back of the book forward, because that's the way Hebrew is backwards, okay? And let me go read this to you. And this is what... <coughs> and by the way, the King James Version was translated from what? Uh, Texas, Receptus. Texas Receptus, which was translated from what? The, the Latin Vulgate. Latin Vulgate. Lo so a lot of the Latin Vulgate and Jerome's ideas are here in this and in the Texas Receptus. Just bara sheath bara elohim et hashemayim we et hearts. That's what it says. Now let's look over here into their English translation of this. When God began to create heaven and earth, what's wrong? It, does it say that at all? No. It says Barashith in beginnings is what it says, in beginnings. Okay? And then he had created, that's third person, master, senior, cow, perfect. In beginnings he had created. That says when God began to create the heaven and earth. What's wrong with the word heaven? It's not until verse yeah, heaven, heaven. Oh, it's, uh, it's singular. It's plural. Hashemayim is plural, isn't it? The word heaven here should be what? Universe. It's talking about the whole cosmos. Okay? And if it would it had been translated correctly, it should have been cosmos. It should have been cosmois. All the heavens, all the orders. And when God began to create heaven and earth, the earth being un formed and void with darkness over the face of the surface of the deep and a wind from God sweeping over the water. That's not right, is it? No. This is really wrong. And this is Jewish Publication Society. It is not a translation. This is an interpretation. We're not doing interpretations here. We're doing translation. Okay? There's a lot of difference between an interpretation and a translation. Genesis 1 and 2, it says, We haaretz. Is that correct, brother? I don't have that with me, but it, I think it's over there. Genesis 1 and 2. <coughs> 
Wiha Aritz Hayata Tohu Wawuhu. We hoshek el pene to home. We rua elahim meripache el pene hamayim. It says here, and the earth, we ha aritz, and ha the earth, eretz, and the earth, she had become. She had become. That's third person feminine, singular, cow perfect. Now, how do you translate that? She had become. Is there any is there any discrepancies or is there any other way to translate that, Brother Roger? Not grammatically. Not grammatically. Anything else besides she had become would be a what? An interpretation. The translation is she had become. She had become tohu. That means desolation. desolation. It means confusion. Emptiness. Wahuhu. Wahuhu means uh, useless wasteness. Empty. Useless wasteness. Now we know that God didn't do that. Isaiah 14, 12 through 17, Ezekiel 28, 12 through 19 tells us what it is. Isaiah 45 and verse 18 says, God did not create the earth. Tohu wavohu. And then it says darkness. Where did the darkness come from, Brother Roger? Wichoshek. Where did that come from? Who is the father of darkness? Lucifer. Lucifer. All right. El Pene Tahom. And here we have darkness upon the faces of the deep. The abyss, a mass of roaring, muddy waters. Okay, that to home. And then it says, "We ruah." What's we we ruah there, Sharon? We ruah. And, uh, spirit. and spirit, and spirit Elohim. It doesn't say a wind from God, does it? And spirit Elohim. Who spirit Elohim? The Holy Spirit. And spirit Elohim brooded, mourned over, suffered over, cherished. It is a feminine singular. Feminine singular, P-L participle. Feminine singular. What about Shekinah? What kind of word is that, Brother Roger? Shekinah. What gender? Oh, feminine. Feminine. Shekinah. Shekinah is that glory that fought, that led Israel around. Now we know that it's Jesus, but we also know that's a feminine word. And here we have the feminine aspect of God that is brooding over, suffering over, mourning over, as the Holy Spirit mourns over each person that he's drawing to him. This is the most beautiful thing. This is the Holy Spirit wooing everybody to God. And all of, how many of you have ever had that? Have you ever been convicted by the Spirit of God? How about it there, Pamela? <laughs> that ever happened to you? Yeah. Roger? Steve? You know, whatever. You know, go the wrong way. Wham, wham, wham. Get back here. You know, do this. Morning upon the faces of the waters. That's a literal translation. That's not what it says here, is it? So this here, let's read that one more time. When Spirit, when God began to create heaven and earth, the earth being unformed and void with darkness over the surface of the deep, and a wind from God sweeping over the water. Does that anywhere kin to what the translation is? Yeah. It's uh that is a Somebody's imagination. That's not what it says in the Bible. Let's go on here a little further. I shall make a place for your seed. And it says, Ka'afar, Ka'afar. It's Amon, Amon in Greek, Amon. Amon means uh, fine dust. How many of you, what kind of fine dust we're talking about here? What kind of fine dust? Have you ever been to Pismo Dunes? And do. What kind of dust is this? It's a silty dust. You go out there in my farm and watch these dust storms. That's what's going to be blowing around is this silty dust. I mean, it can get in your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your nose, 
everything constantly. It's a fine dust. And that's the kind of dust that's on the seashore, which is the sands of the seashore, this fine dust. Did you know that, that people began, they were running out of ocean sand in some places? What's ocean sand? What, if you melt ocean sand, what does it become? Glass. Do you know that they were taking up bottles and grinding them up real fine and putting them as sand on shores? have to grind it up real fine where it doesn't cut you anymore. They grind this up and they make sand out of it. That's pretty funny because that's those, glass, those glasses were one time sand. Now they go back to being sand again. Like sand dust of the earth. Sand dust of the earth which is asher which him if and then we have the word you call, you call there. That is, he is able is what it actually should be. He keeps on being able. He keeps on being able. You call. He keeps on being able. Third person, master, senior, cal, imperfect. That comes from we call. Any man, that word ish there means any man. And then we have the limb. Noth, limnoth. Now the uh, the Greek word for this is ex arithe me the sete. We get a word arithmetic from that word. Arithmetic in English comes out of that Greek word. All of your scientific medical terms come from what language in English? Greek. So the word arithmetic comes from Greek. All right. How about the word cardia? That is a Greek word, and that medical term is your heart. Cardiac arrest. Your heart stopped. Two number. Infinitive construct cal stem. Two number. Comes from mena, to number. Et, sign a direct object. And then we have this word dust again. Dust. This word uh, afar. Dust, fine dust. How many grains of fine dust are is there in a square inch? Could you, could you, can you count that, brother Steve? No. Just one square inch. How about the whole seashore? <coughs> now, is this somewhat of an accurate, or is this a hyperbole? One would hope it's a hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> What is hyperbole, Brother Russ? you remember what a hyperbole is? Sharon? It's an exaggeration. An exaggeration. It's a figure of speech, isn't it? So here we have somewhat of a figure of speech. The, the sand shore, the sea of all the, it's like all the shores of the, all the lips of the seas, all the dust. How many people have been born that were related to Abraham since Abraham? No idea. Millions. Billions, probably. Billions, I imagine. I'm literally, I chased my, my DNA, and I am actually a, a long-distance seed of Abraham. A long time ago. But I'm literally, I go from that area. Levantine. Levant. And I shall make your seed like the dust of the earth, like the dust of the whole earth. I'm going to tell you something. Abraham has had millions, maybe billions of, of, of children. But I don't know how many billions of dust particles are in the world. Billions, billions, quadrillions, many, many, lots of it. So this would be what kind of a figure of speech? A hyperbole. It doesn't mean it's less important or less factual. A hyperbole. To number the dust of the earth. Also your seed may be numbered. We don't know how many children Abraham's had. He had three wives, didn't he? Sarah was Shemite, which we have Yitchik or Isaac coming from her. From her. And then we have uh, Hagar. And then how many sons did was his last wife? How many sons did she have? Keturah? 
six sons, I think, six or eight. I can't remember. And they populated, this is basically where all the Arabs come from, are from Keturah, more from Keturah than from Ishmael. We're all cousins. 13 verse 17. Kom Hithalik Ba'aris Lo Eureka Yule Ra Hiba Ki Lika Etanina Then he says here uh, and it is in the Hebrew Anastas Anastas What is Anastas there? That means resurrection. Anastas, stand up again. And it says here, arise, stand up, masculine singular cow imperative. This is what he said to the young girl. Yes, Talitha Kumei. Talitha Kumei, what language is that, Brother Roger? Aramaic. Aramaic. Aramaic is very kin to Hebrew. Kumei, and here we have kum. And this would be in the term. Kum. Kumei. Kum, rise, stand up. Hithal, hithalika, hithalik that is. And you uh, keep on walking about. Masculine senior hithal imperative. You walk about. Now, back down in Australia, down under down there, people take off and they go on a walkabout, don't they? Crocodile Dundee type person. You know, they go on a walkabout. They go exploring. Marilyn would have made a good explorer. You think so, Marilyn? Yeah, you'd like to explore all over the place. I told her she should have been a truck driver. An explorer. Except she'd been stopping too many places, I know. Walk about inland. Literally inland. Uh, and then it says, Liarika. Liarika. Look at that. Le on the front of that, le, meth on the front of that. What is that thing? That's on page 514 to 17, 515. That is a preposition, isn't it? A little preposition, Hebrew preposition. To its uh, length, length. And then it says, you la ra hiva. And to its breadth, to its width, to its length and to its width, because to you, Lika, to you, I shall give her. I shall give her. First person construct, senior, cal, imper imperfect. I shall keep on giving her. The suffix is third person, feminine, singular. Who's the her? The ah, it's the land. I shall give this land to you. 13 verse 18. Why ye... Why you call? Abraham. Why you vu? Why you shall? Be ilon. Mamre. Asher. Be Hebron. Why you been? Shem. Mezbiah. Li and then Hadavar. And he moved. And what does it mean here? And he moved. Why ye ho? Why ye ho? He pulled up tent stakes and drove them back down. Abraham did not live in a city any longer. He lived in Ur of the Chaldees, which was one of the most populated big city areas where they had great, great big buildings, libraries. Uh, the libraries of the Ur of the Chaldees would uh, would challenge any library we got today basically our libraries are falling apart you know how you judge a nation you know how you judge a nation by what brother Roger by its libraries, by its libraries and what by its roads and what else three things by its postal service that's how you judge a nation that's what you call <laughs> infrastructure we got F minus <laughs> We've had F minus for 20 years. All nations have been judged by what? Its roads, its libraries, and its postal service. 
That's the way it is. This is what we call infrastructure. If you don't have an infrastructure, you're a, a fallen apart nation. The era of the Chaldees had a real good infrastructure. Who else had a real good infrastructure at the same period of time? Tremendous. Who else? Rome. No, Rome wasn't there. Babylon wasn't there yet. Egypt. Egypt. Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim goes way back. And as far as we know, back in that culture, how long ago is the Sphinx, Brother Roger? Pre-flood. Pre Before or in during the time of Noah. That's the Sphinx. That goes way back. That's one of the oldest structures in the world. Is that why it has water erosion on it? That's right. That's the reason why. It's got water erosion. That's what they saw. There hadn't been any water around there for a long time, people. That went back before the flood. Now, Napoleon was a little rough on the Sphinx, wasn't he? Shooting his nose off his men and all that kind of stuff and carrying things off. What were the pyramids, what were they covered with? Alabaster. Alabaster. And, they, and they used to shine like silver or, or gold and in, originally when they were there. Back in the days of the Pharaoh, they were covered with like glass, this, this alabaster. Covered with, where did that alabaster go? They carried it off to Europe. Where did the mummies go? They carried them off to Europe. They carried a lot of those treasures off into Europe. But during this period of time, is, is, or the era of the Chaldees had an infrastructure and the Egyptians had an infrastructure, the Sanskrit. The Sanskrit. This is, goes way back in culture. What was going on over here in America, Brother Roger, at this time, same period of time? What's the oldest mummies in the world? South America. In South America. The oldest mummies in the world are in South America. Did they build pyramids in South America? Yes, yes they did. Did they build gigantic cities? Did they have medicine? Did they have infrastructure? Did they have a postal system? <coughs> have libraries? Did they have mathematics? Absolutely. So we have these giant cultures. And that culture in, in the, the North, Central, and South America was going exactly the same time as it was going in Egypt and in the early Chaldees. Very highly populated, all these. And he pulled up tent stakes. Now he is a full-time RVer. Okay? He's following the grass. One of these days I'll show you this movie I have called Grass. And it's looking at these Bedouins living like Abraham living, and you can see what Abraham did. It's unbelievable what those people did. There's no, you've seen that movie. That's not, Sharon, have you seen that movie, Grass? We gotta, we'll look at that together one of these days. And he kept on pounding tent stakes and kept on moving tent stakes and pulling them up Abram. And he came in. He came in. Third person, master, senior, cow, wow, consecutive, and perfect. Brother uh, Russ, is this opening things up a little bit better for you <laughs> when you see all the culture? <coughs> it is. It's, it's different, isn't it? I'm not understanding the language and stuff. Yeah, but well, I, I don't I expect you to understand yeah. it in a few weeks. And then it says here, why ye shev? Why ye shev? That third person, master, senior, cow, wow, consecutive, and perfect. And what is that? How is that translated, Brother Roger? The conjunction and. Okay. The base word Shev, Yeshev. Uh huh. And uh, so he went and kept on going. He went and kept on going. All right. He went and kept on going. And he kept on driving down tent stakes and picking them up. And then it says here, Be Ilone. Be ilone. And that means Beth is what? Preposition. In or by the uh, live oaks. Live oaks. That's what the word live oaks. I used to cut a lot of live oaks. Live oaks up here around Glenville, you look up there and you'll see these live oaks that got green leaves that look like holly all year long. And underneath those live oaks, grass won't grow. Do you do that when you're a kid? What? I uh I cut a lot of wood, thousands of cords of firewood in the woods. I know there was a lot here, wasn't there? Oh, there was a lot of wood here. Yeah, 
Yes, there was a lot of wood here. Most of this here, most of the woods here were what, Marilyn? Come on, you live then. Like I did, like back then. What populated this whole country here? Cottonwoods and what else? Mesquite. Cottonwoods and mesquite. Mesquite is a thorny wood. When we couldn't go in the woods when I was young as a woodcutter, you know where we went? We went out here in the, what they call the land company out there, where all of the mesquite were, and they wanted that mesquite out of there. Coles Levy. Yeah. All out into that area. And we would cut mesquite. When we couldn't go in the woods, when there's too much wood or too, too much, it was either too much snow or too much water. You couldn't get in there. And then we have the live oaks of Mamre. Mamre. The oaks of Mamre. Which, now where is Mamre? Have you been there, Sharon? I have. This is a dangerous area to be in. Which, in Hebron. Hebron means a ford. Hebron means ford. In Hebron. Called Abnon, by the way. And he built to a pattern. And he built to a pattern. Hebron is 22 miles south of Jerusalem. And I've been in there. That is a most wonderful place. Very dangerous place to be. You cannot go there. I went there because I was not on one of these regular tours. I was on an archaeological tours. And what do you mean when you're on an archaeological tour, Sharon? It means you go places dangerous. We went into dangerous places where all these bullets were flying. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. I heard a lot of that. Matter of fact, it's on the, t on the tapes where I taped it, isn't it, Maryland? Yeah. You can hear the machine gun fire and the bombs going off and these tapes in the background. And so I was, uh, I was out there in the fighting. Brother Madden was with me, and he, his old big voice, he said, Brother Phillips, I haven't heard so much gunfire since World War II. Makes me want to dig a foxhole. <laughs> <laughs> and he was an Anzio. And he built according to a pattern, third person master singing her cow while consecutive and perfect. There, Shem, Mizbaah, Mizbaah. There was a Mizpah Hotel in Tonopah, Nevada one time. I guess it's still there. They had the finest restaurant in the bottom of that hotel that I've ever been in in my life. And that was called the Jack Dempsey Room. And I used to go over there. I had a friend that lived up there, Travis Patterson, and I was always working on his radios. He said, he say, Jim, if you'll come up here and put some tubes in my radio and, and line it back up and everything else, I'll take you down there to the Jack Dempsey room and I'll buy you two lobster flaming yon and lobster dinners. Well, I could only eat one at the most. He ate the others. He'd order four of them and he'd eat three of the four and then ask me if I wanted to go out for pizza for dessert. That guy could eat, boy. Door gunner. You know what a door gunner is, Brother Roger? I've seen a few. Yeah, you've seen a few. You had a few, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's rough, isn't it? Yeah. He used to tell me about shooting and going in those places and, and shooting those machine guns until the barrel started falling off and he had a wrench that he'd twist the barrel off and stick another the wrench and keep on shooting. Old oh, Travis. I loved him like a brother, more than a brother. An altar to Jehovah. Le Hadavar to Jehovah. 14 and verse 1 is where we are. Chapter 14 and 1. So we got through chapter 13. Why he? Be me. Amaraphel. Melech. Shinar. Arok. Melech. Elasar. Kedla. Kedari Lamor. Mer, actually. Melek. Elam. We Tedal. Melek. Goyim. Now, what are we doing here? We're looking. Sharon, you want to come up there and read that to me from uh, the Amplified Bible? Let's look at this situation. We're going into another, n another uh, time with old Abram. In the days of the kings, Aramphel of Shinar, Ariok of Elisar, Shador, hmm, I don't know what it is. La Amor. La Amor of Elam and Tidal of Goim. 
All right. Now, last week we studied these guys' names, didn't we? So, oh, who who went down there amongst these rascals? Who was the one that went down there amongst these? Lot. Huh? Lot. Lot was down there, but who went down there to visit him? Abraham. Who? Abraham. Who went down to visit Lot? The angels. Huh? No, not the Lot, not the angels yet. In the book of Jasher, who went down there to visit Lot? Eliezer. Who was Eliezer? That's Abraham's number one man, Eliezer. Okay? And he would have been, if he hadn't had a son, that would have been his heir too. And, and became, and he became in days, BMA, in days of Amma Raphael. That's a powerful people, a people of Raphael. Okay? A powerful people. These were strong people. And it were King Malek of Shinar. All right? The king of Arioch, Babylonia. Shinar. The land of Shinar, ba Babylonia. Of Arioch. That means lion like. Lion like. And uh, then we have a word king of Elasar. Elasar is a Chaldean town uh, left of the Euphrates. And then Chadlamar. Chadlamar means uh, sheaf land. Sheaf band. King of Elam. Elam means youth. And Tidal. And Tidal, king of Gaim. The word title there means splendor or renown. Now here we have these people. We have these kings. And these kings are going to come and do what? They're going to play havoc with these people. Let's read the next one. Asu, Melchama, Et, Bera, Melek, Sidom, Wiet, Birsha, Melech, Amora, Shanav, Melech, Adma, we shall there, we shall move there, Melech, Saboim, Yumelech, Bela, He, Store. And they made and they made war. Milahamah. War. With Bera. Bera means gift, by the way. With, with Bera. King of Sodom. Now that's the king of Sodom. Now remember, Abimelech, not Abimelech, but uh, Eliezer gave them different names, didn't he? And Bersha. Bershaw, what does what Bershaw mean? You remember what Bershaw means? Sharon, you remember what that word means? Yes, strong. It means he's a fat boy. Oh. <laughs> the fat boy. I used to work out in the oil fields with a guy they called Fat Boy. His name was Herschel. And everybody called him Fat Boy. He was a good good guy. He was a little bit thick, but he was a hard worker. Uh, fat boy. A king of Gamara. What does Gamara mean? Gamara. What's that word mean, Brother Roger? You remember? It means uh, to be submersed. Submersed. Yeah. Gamara. With lots of water. <laughs> Dipped. Baptized. All right. They're going to be baptized with what? Fire. Okay. Uh, Shanab. Okay, Shinab, a uh, king of Adma. That means uh, an earthwork or fortress. And Shemeber, that means splendor or heroism. Uh, king of Zeboim, and that means wild places. And King Bela, which means consumption. Uh, it is Zor. Zor means little. By the Dead Sea is where that was. 14 and verse 3. And we'll finish this verse and then we'll turn you loose on the world unless you got a question. Call Ele Havoru El Emek 
Hasidim Hu Yam Hamelah. All, look at that, call means all. All these, L.A. is these. We, L.A. Shemot, what is that? And these names. And these names, all right, here's the word e is, or and these. And these are all these grouped together. Third person construct, plural, cal, perfect. They had been grouped together or united. All of these were united. Unto a valley, a mech. The valley, and valley means deep. A deep area. The San Joaquin Valley is deep, isn't it? It goes almost down to sea level in some places. This is a deep valley, the San Joaquin Valley. And then it was Hasidim. And that means extension. And this being sea salt. What's the salt sea? The Dead Sea is the salt sea. Now let's look at the history of the salt sea real quick while we're, while we're here. And we started at 13 and verse, uh, where did we start today? 13, 15? 13, 15 through 14, 3. What about the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea? How did it get that way? Tell me how the Salt Sea got What? It has no outlet. But where did he get the salt, Brother Roger? Galilee. Galilee. All right. Now, is the what we call the uh, Jordan Rift. The Jordan Rift. Uh, do you know anything about the Jordan Rift, Brother Russ? How about Sharon? You've been there. Yeah, it's, well, there's this big gash. This big, deep. This The big, deep gash. That's what we're talking about, the valley. Okay. This deep valley. And this deep valley is all below sea level. And what's the closest sea? Mediterranean. The Mediterranean Sea. That's that beautiful blue water like you've never seen before any place in the world, that Mediterranean. The Mediterranean Sea the Mediterranean Sea is here and we go over these mountains and then we come down here into the, the Jordan Rift. And that runs a long way. An airplane pilot, if you fly in here, you can fly this whole Jordan Rift below sea level. So we come all the way up here to the Sea of Galilee, which is still below sea level. And at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, what are there down there, Brother Roger? Natural salt, Natural salt springs. And where do you think that's coming from? Mediterranean. Mediterranean. And it's all downhill, isn't it? So the water will flow. And so for thousands of years, salt springs in the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, plus we have water, fresh water coming and mixing with salt water and then it goes all the way down the Jordan River and Jordan means what? Descending. Descending. All the way down the Jordan River and it ends up into the sea with no outlet which is the Dead Sea and guess what happens? And it's pretty hot down there, isn't it? Real hot. And so what happens when you have a real a lot of heat in an area where you have water? Evaporate. Evaporates. If you go out here it's almost all gone now. I remember when I could go out there to the lake bottom. The lake bottom was all white. If you go out there to Soda Springs, if you go out there to uh, Owens Lake, Owens Lake is all white because they, L.A. stole the water. If you go out there to the uh, Teresa Plains, you go out there to the recent plains and you'll see a great salt lake out there, won't you? Where this salt is. Because there's no outlets and all the water would run down there and it had a lot of salt content and there it was. A lot of salt content and there it was. Up there in the Owens Valley, you have Mono Lake up there which has got a very high salt content in it, doesn't it? It stayed there. Water ran there and stayed there for thousands of years. Go down there to the Owens Lake, and it stayed there for a thousand years until the, the old boys uh, started stealing the water out of the Owens Valley. The Owens Valley was a paradise at one time. And how many of you went to uh, uh, Merle Haggard's funeral the other day? Anybody go to the funeral? The last song he wrote, the last song he wrote when he was on his deathbed, you know what he wrote about? The Kern River. He said, and you know about politicians, don't you, brother? 
they're a little bit crooked, aren't they? Most yeah. of the time. Not all of them. Not all of them, but, but some of them are a little crooked. He talked about this last song. He talked about the Kern River. You know he wrote about the Kern River. He'll never swim in the Kern River again and all that stuff. You know, you know his best friend lost his best friend and all that. Merle Haggard wrote that song. This song, he said, when he lived in, in, in Bakersfield, and he talked about the Kern River, but now it's dry because two politicians stole the water from Kern River, and now it's dry. <laughs> That's true. That's what happened. It's gone into the L.A. Aqueduct, aqueduct just exactly like what happened to Lone Valley because of the crooked politicians and the board of supervisors and all of them, crooked people. Right? Yeah. Kern River Blues, that's the name of it, Kern River Blues. The Salt Sea, that salt went down there for thousands of years. But something else happened to make it salty too, didn't it? The Lord turned Mrs. Lott, Mrs. Lott <laughs> and, the, and remember last week we read her name, remember she had a name. He turned her into salt, a pillar of salt. And the water would wash and the rains would wash her down into that salt sea and, and that's where all of this salt come from. And then what else happened? We're gonna we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but what happened there in Sodom and Gomorrah later? First of all, Jehovah saves them by Abraham's hand, and he gives Abraham the ability to go and he's got a lot of men in his army and they're very trained soldiers. They're better than all these other five kings. He whooped them all and rescues Lot and all the other kings and brings them back home. And uh, they didn't appreciate it very much, did they? These were bad people. God is a God of grace, isn't he? Amen. He is a God of grace. And that's what we see always in here, a God of grace. I'm teaching on the, the uh, ten plagues of Egypt right now and, and the uh, parables of the Old Testament. And, and miracles are parables in action, divine parables in action. And God, how long did it take for all of those all of those ten miracles, all those ten plagues to take place. You remember how long that was? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Well, the Mishnah and the Talmud say a year. Okay, a complete cycle. Some people say it was as short as 30 days. I don't believe that at all. Some of them say it's 40. It had to be at least five months to nine months minimum. But it could have been a year. Do you know what that was, that whole period of time was? That's a period of grace. There are nine penal Miracles, nine penal plagues. What is a penal? What's penal mean? If you don't, then I will. <laughs> <laughs> what does penal mean? Correction. It means correction or punishment. Nine penal plagues, and one beyond the point of no return. Nine penal plagues. These people did. Some people repent under those nine penal plagues, and every day that that happened was one more extension of grace. But at the end however long it was, five, nine, or twelve months, there was a closing place. No more grace. Then we have the final judgment. What was the final judgment? The death of the firstborn. There, was, there actually were how many miracles? How many miracles did Moses and Aaron do? How many great miracles in Egypt did they do? One of them wasn't penal. What was that? It was a contest of gods. That's when Aaron threw down his rod and it became a leviathan, a dragon. And then Janus and Jambres, the sons of Balaam, threw down their rods and they became dragons. And we have two of the devil's dragons against one of God's dragons and God's dragon ate them up. Now we have the contest of the gods. Just to begin with, this is a preface of coming attractions. So there's actually the 11th miracle in it, though it was really the first. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. God is a God of grace. God gave all these people time to repent, didn't he? God gives everybody time to repent. But there's a time when it's over, huh? No more. Finished. Well, think about that. Think about it. If you're out there, and I know this thing is going to go all over the world, maybe somebody out there that doesn't know the Lord. God has given you up until now to repent. Pamela, you, you lived a long time going to church and being very religious without actually asking the Lord to save your soul and repenting of your sins. If you had died, 
Just being religious, what would he have done? You'd have gone to hell. Religion is not enough. You have to be born again. You have to be saved. I had that girl call me from Texas. And she was a preacher's wife. And she had been in church 30-something years in her life. She had been baptized when she was a child. But she had never repented and asked the Lord to save her soul. And she was a Sunday school teacher. And her pastor told her she was okay. And her husband told her she was okay because she was a real good person. But she had, she was troubled by the Ruah Elohim, Spirit God. And he didn't turn her loose. And she listened to me preach and she said, Boy, that man can tell me what I need. <laughs> so she called Sermon Audio and then she called Valley Baptist Church and they didn't want to give her my phone number. And she was bawling and crying and going on. Finally they gave her my phone number and she called me and said, Dr. Phillips, am I bothering you? I said, what do you need? I'm so-and-so from Texas. I know that you can answer my question. She said, I think I'm going to hell. I said, why? She said, I just feel like I'm going to hell. I feel terrible. Why? Well, I've gone to church all my life. I've been a Sunday school leader. I, I went forward in vacation Bible school and accepted the Lord and was baptized. Mm -hmm. Sounds real good, doesn't it? Real good. I said, Missy, did you ever repent of your sins and ask the Lord to save your soul? And she was quiet for a little bit. And she said, no. Well, I said, you know why you feel real bad? Because you're lost and going to hell. It didn't work. She just went with other little kids and went forward and all. This happens, doesn't it? And this is what we call easy believism sometimes. But you've got to be saved. You've got to repent. You've got to call upon the Lord and ask Him to save your soul. You've got to do that. And if you don't do that, it's not okay. You're not okay. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Forgive us for we failed you. I pray that your word goes out all over the world, and I know it will. And if there's one lost out there, that they will come to know you right this moment, whenever they hear this message. That they will quit being religious and just trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.